Shanti 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 Om Sthapakaya Chadamasya Sarvadharma Swarupine Sthapakaya Chadamasya Sarvadharma Swarupine Avadharvanishtha Rama Krishna Yate Nama Asatoma Sad Gamaya Tamasoma Joder Gamaya Let us offer our salutations to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God Incarnate, who came to establish religion universal. Let us pray to him to lead us from unreal to real, to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality. We have been studying Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, where Sri Ramakrishna has given number of practical instructions for spiritual seekers in the world. Sri Ramakrishna's life itself is a demonstration of the integrated spirituality. All the religions have been validated by Sri Ramakrishna. Each one is great. Each one is a glorious way to reach God. But people, on account of their ignorance about the real meaning of religion, unnecessarily create conflicts among the people. The practice of religion means one should become pure enough. And in course of time he becomes divine himself. So realization of the divinity is the sole purpose of religion. So let everyone has one's own freedom to choose whatever path one wants. Why should there be any kind of force of imposing thoughts upon the people? Keep open the book. Whoever wants, let them read. Apply the teachings in life and reach the goal. So today's topic I have chosen from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. How to cultivate love of God. That's most important. If you are practicing religion, your whole being must be vibrating with love. What kind of love? How should one love God? 
Sri Ramakrishna said in the Gospel. Gauri used to say that one must become like Sita to understand Rama. Like Bhagavati, the Divine Mother, to understand Bhagwan, Shiva. One must practice austerity as Bhagavati did in order to attain Shiva. One must cultivate the attitude of Prakriti in order to realize Purusha, the attitude of a friend, a handmaid or a mother. Attitude is very important and holding on to the ideal is very important. Not shifting the ideal every moment. Sri Ramakrishna continues, I saw Sita in a vision. I found that her entire mind was concentrated on Rama. She was totally indifferent to everything. Her hands, her feet, her clothes, her jewels. It seemed that Rama had filled every bit of her life and she could not remain alive without Rama. Master Mahasya said, Yes, sir. She was mad with love for Rama. Sri Ramakrishna said, Mad. That's the word. One must become mad with love in order to realize God. But that love is not possible if the mind dwells on lust and gold. Sex life with a woman. What happiness is there in that? The realization of God gives 10 million times more happiness. Gauri used to say that when a person attains ecstatic love of God, all the pores of the skin, even the roots of the hair, become like so many sexual organs. And in every pore the aspirant enjoys the happiness of communion with Atman. So, one really experiences true happiness in realizing God. One must call on God with a longing heart. How can a devotee attain such love? It's a very important question. Sri Ramakrishna himself answers that question. First, the company of holy persons. Like ashrama, spiritual centers, retreat centers. Where the atmosphere is conducive for high thinking. That awakens Shraddha faith in God. Shraddhavan labate jnanam. One who is full of Shraddha experiences the knowledge. Then comes Nishtha. First Shraddha is awakened. It is followed by Nishtha, single-minded devotion to the ideal. In that stage the devotee doesn't like to hear anything but talk about God. He performs only those acts that please God. After this single-minded devotion comes bhakti, devotion to God. The real love is awakened in the heart. Then comes bhava. Next, mahabhava. Then, prema. And last of all, the attainment of God Himself. 
see how many stages are there only for ishvara kotis such as incarnations is it possible to have mahabhava or prema chaitanya mahaprabhu had that the knowledge of a worldly person the knowledge of a devotee and the knowledge of an incarnation are by no means of the same degree the knowledge of a worldly person is like the light of an oil lamp which shows only the inside of a room through such knowledge he eats and drinks attends to household chores protects his body brings up his children and so on and so on the knowledge of a devotee he is like the light of the moon which illumines objects both inside and outside a room but such light doesn't enable him to see a distant or a very minute object the knowledge of an incarnation of god he is like the light of the sun through that light the incarnation sees everything inside and outside big and small shri ramakrishna used to say anybody coming to see shri ramakrishna he would immediately understand everything about that person who is seeing him same way vivekananda ji had also had that illuminating knowledge illuminating knowledge once he was uh, giving discourse in america in detroit about the powers of the mind one of the audience <coughs> began to question when the swamiji is still continuing his talk he should not have disturbed in the middle but he stood up and began to question the swamiji he was speaking all this uh, ideas about mind his power so on and so forth can you tell me what is in my mind Swamiji didn't care his words. For Swamiji, such a person was like a small mouse. He didn't even take notice of it. And all the other people in the audience, they were all shocked why this man is disturbing. But Swamiji continued his talk as if nothing had happened. again the man stood up again shouted again shouted continuously shouting tell me what is in my mind then swamiji wanted to teach him he was talking continuously so dealing with some subject surprisingly he stopped and gazed at that person who was asking the question who was interrupting simply gazed him he didn't say anything that caused ripples in the hearts of that person he began to shiver and he began to shout oh swami please don't disclose i know you are digging out everything from my heart please i beg you i pa- please pardon me like he began to weep Swamiji was incarnation of kindness, compassion. That is the greatness of people. They forgive. Then he continued his topic as if nothing has happened. So that is the knowledge of an incarnation of God, like the light of the sun. the mind of a worldly person is no doubt like a muddy water but it can be made clear 
by purifying agent discrimination vichara shakti and renunciation tyag are the purifying agent vaishnava sadhu asked a question sir is a man born again Sri Ramakrishna said, it is said in the Gita that a man is reborn with those tendencies that are in his mind at the time of his death. King Bharat thought of his deer at the time of death and was reborn as a deer. <laughs> Then Vaishnava said, I could believe in rebirth only if an eye witness told me about it sri ramakrishna said i don't know about that my dear sir i can't cure my own illness and you ask me to tell you what happens after death what you are talking about only shows your petty mind try to cultivate love of god you are born as a human being only to attain divine love you have come to the orchard to eat mangoes what need is there of knowing how many thousands of branches and millions of leaves there are in the orchard to bother about what happens after death how silly she ran to scold him to love god in the most practical way is to love all our fellow beings if we feel for others in the same way as we feel for our own dear ones we love god if instead of seeing faults in others we look within ourselves we are loving god if instead of robbing others to help ourselves we rob ourselves to help others we are loving god if we suffer in the sufferings of others and feel happy in the happiness of others we are loving god if instead of worrying over our own misfortunes we think ourselves more fortunate than many many others we are loving god if we endure our lot with patience and contentment accepting it as his will we are loving god if we understand and feel that the greatest act of devotion and worship to god is not to hurt or harm any of his beings we are loving god to love god has it ought to be loved we must live for god and die for god knowing that the goal of life is to live to realize god to love god and find him as our own self of all the forces that can best overcome all difficulties the greatest is the force of love because the greatest law of god is love which holds the key to all problems the mighty force not only enables one to put the ideal of selfless service into practice but also transforms one into god it has been possible through love for man to become god and when god becomes man it's also due to his love for his beings why god incarnates as human being just for the sake of immense love towards humanity out of tremendous compassion god forces himself to incarnate to help humanity pure love is matchless in majesty it has no parallel in power and there is no darkness it cannot dispel it is the undying flame that has set life aglow the lasting emancipation of man depends upon his love for god and upon god's love for one and all where there is love there is oneness 
and in complete oneness. The infinite is realized completely at all times and in every sphere of life, be it science, art, religion or beauty. The spirit of true love and sacrifice is beyond all ledges and needs no measures. A constant wish to love and be loving and a non-calculating will to sacrifice in every walk of life, high and low, big and small, between home and office, streets and cities, countries and continents, are the best anti-selfish measures that man can take in order to be really selfful and joyful. Love also means suffering and pain for oneself and happiness for others. To the giver, it is suffering without malice or hatred. To the receiver, it is a blessing without obligation. Love alone knows how to give without necessarily bargaining for a return. There is nothing that love cannot achieve and there is nothing that love cannot sacrifice. Love for God, love for fellow beings, love for service and love of sacrifices. In short, love in any shape and form is the finest give and take in the world. Ultimately, it is love that will bring about the much desired universal leveling of human beings all over the world without necessarily disturbing the inherent diversities of details about mankind. All the same, in order to burst out in a mighty big spirit to serve as a beacon for those who may yet be groping in the darkness of selfishness, Love needs to be kindled and rekindled in the abysmal darkness of selfish thoughts, selfish words and selfish deeds. The light of love is not free from its fire of sacrifice. Like heat and light, love and sacrifice go hand in hand. The true spirit of sacrifice that springs spontaneously does not and cannot reserve itself for particular objects and special occasions. <coughs> Love and coercion can never go together. Love has to spring spontaneously from within. It is in no way amenable to any form of inner or outer force and it cannot be forced upon anybody, yet it can be awakened in one through love itself. Love cannot be born of mere determination. Through exercise of will, one cannot best be dutiful. One may, through struggle and effort, succeed in securing that his external action is in conformity with his conception of what is right. But such action is spiritually barren because it lacks the inward duty of spontaneous love. Like every great virtue, Love, the mainspring of all life, can also be misapplied. It may lead to the height of God intoxication or to the depths of despair. Between these two extremes are many kinds of love. On the one hand, love does exist in all the phases of human life. But here it is latent or is limited and poisoned by personal ambitions, racial pride, narrow loyalties, and rivalries, and by attachment to sex, nationality, sect, caste or religion. On the other hand, the pure and real love has also its stages, the highest being the gift of God to love Him. When one truly loves God, one longs for union with Him, and this supreme longing is based on the desire of giving up one's whole being to the Beloved. True love is very different from an evanescent outburst of indulgent emotionalism or the innervating stupor of a slumbering heart. It can never come to those whose heart is darkened by selfish cravings or weakened 
by constant reliance upon the lures and stimulations of the passing objects of sense even when truly loves humanity one longs to give one's all for its happiness when the when the one, when one truly loves one's country there is a longing to sacrifice one's very life without seeking reward and without the least thought of having loved and served <laughs> when one truly loves one's friends there is a longing to help them without making them feel under the least obligation <clears throat> when truly loving one's enemies when truly loving one's enemies one longs to make them friends true love for one's parents or family makes one long to give them every comfort at the cost of one's soul thought of self is always absent in the different longings <coughs> connected with the various stages of pure real love a single thought of self <coughs> would be an adulteration divine love is qualitatively different from human love human love is for the many in the one and divine love is for the one in the many human love leads to innumerable complications and tangles but divine love leads to integration and freedom human love in its personal and impersonal aspects is limited but divine love with its fusion of the personal and the impersonal aspects is infinite in being and expression divine love makes us be true to ourselves and to ones thus it is the solution to all our difficulties and problems it frees us from every kind of binding purifies our hearts and glorifies our being to those whose hearts are pure and simple true love comes as a gift through the activating grace of a perfect master and this divine love will perform the supreme miracle of bringing god into the hearts of men all the same human love should not be despised even when it is fraught with limitations it is bound to break through all these limitations and initiate an aspirant in the eternal life in the truth god listens to the language of the heart which constitutes love the most practical way for the common man to express this language of the heart while is attending to daily life duties is to speak lovingly think lovingly and act lovingly towards all mankind irrespective of caste creed and position taking god to be present in each and every one to realize god we must love him losing ourselves in his infinite self we can love god by surrendering to the perfect master who is god's personal manifestation we can also love god by loving our fellow beings by giving them happiness at the cost of our own happiness by rendering them service at sacrifice of our interests and by dedicating our lives at the altar of selfless work when we love god intensely through any of these channels we finally know him to be our own self the beginning of real love is obedience and the highest aspect of this love which surpasses that of love itself is the aspect which culminates into the perfect obedience or supreme resignation to the will and wish of the beloved in this love are embodied all yogas known as known to saints and seekers when we analyze the stages that lead to love of god we understand that faith or shraddha is the first stage without shraddha there is no way to obtain love of god from faith one seeks saintly association called sadhu sangha this leads to shelter at the feet of a spiritual teacher thereafter 
initiation follows initiation gives rise to bhajana kriya or the personal worship of god bhajana kriya leads to anartha nivrutti which is a stage where one clears up unwanted things from his heart after anartha nivrutti one's faith can develop and one enters the stage called nishta or mature faith from nishta taste or ruchi develops this leads to the stage called asakti or deep attachment from asakti spiritual emotions called bhava spring forth this eventually ripens into the stage called love of god prema therefore everyone should seek shelter at the feet of a spiritual teacher and receive initiation which is the source of bhajana bhakti is a slender thread of prem or love that binds the heart of a devotee with the lotus feet of the lord bhakti is intense devotion and supreme attachment to god bhakti is supreme love for god it is a spontaneous outpouring of prem towards the beloved it is pure and selfish divine love or shuddha prem there is not a bit of bargaining or expectation of anything here this higher feeling is indescribable in words it has to be sincerely experienced by the devotees bhakti is a sacred higher emotion with sublime sentiments that unites the devotee with the lord mark how love develops first arises faith then follows attraction and after that adoration adoration leads to suppression of mundane desires the result is single mindedness and satisfaction then grow attachment and supreme love towards god in this type of highest bhakti all attraction attachment which one has to objects of enjoyment are transferred to the only dearest object namely god this leads the devotee to an eternal union with his beloved and culminates in oneness bhakti is of various kinds one classification is sakamya and nishkamya bhakti sakamya bhakti is devotion with desire for material gains a man wants wealth with this motive practices bhakti another man wants freedom from diseases and therefore does japa and offers prayers a third one wants to become a minister or want a high position and does upasana with the same this is sakamya bhakti whatever you want the lord will certainly give you if your bhakti is intense and if your prayers are sincerely offered from the bottom of your heart but you will not get supreme satisfaction immortality and moksha through sakamya bhakti your bhakti therefore should always be nishkamya bhakti god has already given you a good position a good job good family enough wealth be contented with this aspire for nishkamya bhakti your heart will be purified and the divine grace will descend upon you be in the communion with the lord you will become one with the lord and you will enjoy all the divine aishwaryas divine attributes like wisdom renunciation power etc all the vibhutis of the lord he will give you he will give you vision he will help you to dwell in him at the same time he will give you all the divine aishwaryas also <laughs> another classification of bhakti is apara bhakti and para bhakti apara bhakti is for the beginners in yoga the beginner decorates an image with flowers and garlands rings the bell offers naivedya wave lights he observes rituals and ceremonies the bhakta here regards the lord as a supreme person who is immanent in that image 
and who can be propitiated through that form only gradually from apara bhakti the devotee goes to para bhakti the highest form of bhakti he sees the lord and lord alone everywhere and he feels his power manifest as the entire universe sri ramakrishna had that unique experience when he got the vision of the divine mother kali he was overwhelmed the whole thing appeared to me as one undivided consciousness the what all pervading and what simhasana shall i see you you are the supreme light in whose borrowed light the sun the moon the stars and the fine and the fire shine shall i wave the light little deeper light before you does the devotee recognizes the transcendental nature of god para bhakti and gyana are one but every bhakta will have to start from apara bhakti before you take your food offer it to god mentally and the food will be purified when you pass through a garden of flowers mentally offer the flowers to the lord offering flowers in worship bhakti is also classified into gauna bhakti and mukhya bhakti gauna bhakti is the lower bhakti and mukhya bhakti is the higher type of bhakti so we should go from stage to stage just as a flower grows in the garden so also gradually we should develop love in the garden of our heart the enemy of devotion is egoism and desire where there is no desire there alone will rama manifest himself where there is no kama there rama manifests the enemies of peace and devotion are lust anger and greed anger destroys peace and health also so knowing all these things we should one should be careful about these enemies about 11 fundamental factors have been prescribed by the great ramanuja acharya for practicing bhakti for cultivating love of god one is viveka discrimination which are shakti one is always be analytical and open minded so viveka second one is vimoka freedom from everything else and longing for god third is satyam or truthfulness one should be practicing truthfulness then fourth one arjavam or straight forwardness no room for crookedness or hypocrisy fifth kriya that is doing good to others trying to help others as much as you can sixth is kalyan or wishing well being to all seventh one is daya or compassion eighth one is ahimsa non injury not hurting anyone in the universe that attitude must be there must not hurt even insect shiram krishna used to say don't find fault with anyone not even in an insect then ninth one is dana or charity tenth one is anavasada or cheerfulness and the last one optimism people put a question sir how can we love god whom we have not seen it is a very common question very relevant question good question it is true also 
how can we love god whom we have not seen the answer is simple but you must have willingness to practice it the answer is live in the company of holy people hear the glories of god study the sacred scriptures worship god first in his several forms as manifested in the world worship any image or picture of the lord or the guru repeat his divine name sing his glories stay for one year in sacred places where the mahatmas had done great tapas by doing all such things you will develop love for god every act must be done that awakens the emotion of bhakti keep the puja room clean decorate the room burn incense sticks light the lamp keep a clean seat take bath wear clean clothes wear rudraksha or tulsi mala all these produce a benign influence on the mind and elevate the mind they generate piety they help to create the nasri bhava or feeling to invoke the deity that you want to worship the mind will be easily concentrated practice of right conduct satsang japa smaran kirtan prayer worship service of saints residence in places of pilgrimage services rendered to the poor and the sick with divine attitude observance of duties offering of all actions and their fruits to the lord feeling the presence of the lord in all beings prostrations before the image and holy people renunciation of earthly enjoyments and wealth charity austerities and vows practice of ahimsa satyam and brahmacharya all these will help you to develop bhakti so god is tremendously loving all the beings why because all the beings are his own children it's quite natural god loves his children it is the children they quarrel and make conflicts but know this idea properly and apply it in life why do you create conflict among people and people why do you unnecessarily waste your time in debating upon the religions of the world you follow what religion you feel best go ahead don't waste your time in idle in all that things no debate no such nonsense hold on to your doing austerity hold on to ideas spiritual ideas take ideas which are most favorable to you and practice them there the matter ends never think that you straighten the world world cannot be straightened world is like a dog's curly tail as long as you hold the dog's tail curly tail by the hand it is straight the moment you lose the grip again it curls back so when we can say this works world is like that no government can straighten the world nobody can straighten the world you have to straighten yourself so it comes to that point individual practice understand the religion realize it and then after realization if you have got energy and vigor 
share that joy with others help others also to go in spiritual path that's the way that's the way we should love god god is invisible but through our love we make him visible through love only you can understand the beauty of god the glory of god only through love you experience it gospel page 1017 we are coming to the last chapter of the gospel sri ramakrishna said all want to be the guru but very few indeed want to be the disciple but you know that rain water doesn't collect on a high mount it collects in low land in a hollow one should have faith in the holy name given by the guru and with it practice spiritual discipline it is said that the rain it dives into the fathomless depths of the ocean and remains there until the pearl is formed at the site of the many brahman devotees assembled there the master said is the meeting of the brahmos a real devotional gathering or a mere show it is very good that the brahma samaj holds regular devotions but one must dive deep mere ceremonial worship or lectures are of no avail one should pray to god that one's attachment to worldly enjoyment may disappear that one may have pure love for his lotus feet the elephant has outer tusks and inner grandeurs as well the tusks are mere ornaments but the elephant chews its food with the grandeurs the inner enjoyment of lust and gold endures the growth of one's devotion what will you achieve through mere public lectures the vulture undoubtedly soars high but its eyes are fixed on the charnel pit the rocket undoubtedly shoots up into the sky but the next moment it falls to the ground he who has renounced his attachment to worldly enjoyments will remember nothing but god in the hour of death otherwise he will think only of worldly things family house wealth name fame through practice a bird can be trained to repeat radha krishna but when a cat catches it it only squawks therefore one should constantly practice the singing of god's name and glories and meditation and contemplation as well and further one should always pray that one's attachment to the worldly things may disappear and one's love for god's lotus feet may grow how so does devoted to god live in the world like a maid servant who performs her duties for her master but always keeps her mind fixed on her own native village that is to say they do their duties in the world keeping their minds on god anyone living anyone leading a worldly life he should to come in contact with his dirt but a household who is a true devotee of god lives like a mud fish which though remaining in the mud is not stained by it brahman and shakti are identical one acquires love and devotion quickly by calling on god as mother saying this the master sang high in the heaven of the mother's feet my mind was soaring like a kite when came a blast of sense rough wind that drove it swiftly toward the earth maya disturbed its even flight by bearing down upon one side and i could make it rise no more entangled in the twisting string of love for children and for wife alas my kite was rent in twain it lost its crest of wisdom soon and downward plunged as i let it go 
how could it go how could it hope to fly again when all its top was torn away though fastened with devotion's card it came to grief in playing here its six opponents worsted it that is six passions kamakola etc now narish chandra rus in this game of smiles and tears and thinks it better never to have played at all he sang again oh mother for yashoda the woods dance when she called thee her precious blue jewel where has thou hidden that lovely form o terrible shama dance that way once for me o mother throw down the sword and take the flute cast off the garland of heads and wear thy wild flower garland as sri ramakrishna sang he left his seat and began to dance the devotees too stood up every now and then the master went into samadhi and the devotees gazed at him intently dr dukari touched the master's eyeballs with his finger to test the genuineness of his samadhi this disgusted the devotees when the music and dancing were over the devotees took their seats just then keshav arrived with some of his brahmo disciple rajendra told him about their great joy in the master's kirtan and requested trilokya to sing again keshav replied since shri ramakrishna has taken his seat the kirtan will sound flat trilokya and the brahmo devotees sang chant o mind the name of hari sing aloud the name of hari praise lord hari's name and praising hari's name o mind cross the ocean of this world hari dwells in earth in water hari dwells in fire and air in sun and moon he dwells hari's ever living presence fills the boundless universe while preparations were being made to give the guests something to eat shri ramakrishna talked with keshav master said with a smile today i enjoyed very much the machine by which a man's picture is taken one thing i noticed was that the impression doesn't stay on a bare piece of glass but it remains when the glass is stained with a black solution in the same way mere hearing of spiritual talk doesn't have any impression people forget it soon afterwards but they can retain spiritual instruction if they are stained inside with earnestness and devotion the master was conducted to the second floor of the house and was asked to sit in a beautiful carpet the ladies waited on him while he ate his meal keshav and the other devotees were also sumptuously fed we shall stop here talking one or two classes the gospel will go over chant the name of the lord and his glory unceasingly that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire worldly lust raging furiously within o name stream down in the moonlight on the lotus heart opening its cup to the lord of thyself o self drowned deep in the waves of his bliss tasting his nectar at every step bathing in his name that both my very selves where is all thy names o lord in each and every name thy power resides no times are set no rites are needful for chanting of thy name so vast is thy mercy how huge then is my wretchedness who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy name o my mind be humbler than a blade of grass be patient and forbearing like a tree Take no honor to thyself, give honor to all. Chant and sizingly the name of the Lord. O Lord and soul of the universe, mine is no prayer for wealth or enemy, the playthings of lust or the toys of fame. As many times as I may be reborn, grant me, O Lord, a steadfast love for thee. A drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one. in thy mercy consider him as dust beneath thy feet oh how i long for the day 
when an instant's separation from the old Lord will be as a thousand years, when my heart burns away with a desire and the world without thee is a heartless void. Prostrate at thy feet let me be in unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence, though it tears my soul asunder. O thou who still hast the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, for thou art my heart's beloved, and thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers, may all realize what is good, may all be actuated by noble thoughts, may all rejoice everywhere. May all be happy, may all be free from disease, may all realize what is good, may none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous, may the virtues are in tranquility, may the tranquil be free from bonds, may the freed make others free. May good be died all people. May the sovereign righteously rule the earth. May all beings ever attain what is good. May the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour rain in time. May the earth be blessed with crops. May all countries be freed from calamity. May holy men live without fear. May the Lord the destroyer of sins, the presiding duty of all sacred works be satisfied. For he being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He, became, he being satisfied, the whole universe feels satisfied. 